Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the best of episode of season two. Um, it's the best of, so you might notice those of you that are watching this on YouTube that Jacob and I have put special effort in. And we are wearing our smart jackets. Jacob, welcome to the best of. Uh, I, you know, are you are you ready for this? Thank you for welcoming me to my own show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, someone's got to do it. No one's ever welcomed me. I just sort of show up. So I just thought I'd do, you know, the right thing. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Super excited. It's been several months, well, much more than that since Matt and I have you know, connected. So it was a good chance for us to go back and look at the past season and, you know, figure out what's the best clips to share with you guys. It's, it's been, been quite a season, season hasn't it? Season three being planned as well for 2022, yeah. uh, which is exciting. Yeah, and we've got some big guests coming up on season three, so definitely check that out. But season two was good. It was jam-packed. You know, Hopefully, you, our listeners, found it full of value. I know Jacob and I found it really interesting. Some of the guests we got on were perhaps not your typical kind of brand or design guests, um, and um, I, I think we've got a good mix. And I think this episode will hopefully uh, showcase that as we go through. So uh, I, I think we, we've kind of all we've kind of picked just bits and bobs that we thought were really, really awesome, didn't we? As we as we've gone through and um, I've got a, I've got about six or seven guests that, that I want to share and, and highlight. And maybe we can talk about them as we go through. Jacob, how many have you got? Yeah, I've selected eight clips. So we're going to have a little bit of discussion about each of those clips and, you know, Reflecting on all these episodes, we realized we really covered a lot, a lot of ground in terms of brand. And, you know, you, once we get into it, you'll realize there's, there's so much to brand and brand building, hence starting this podcast. But yeah, we've had some incredible guests. So let's get into it now. Okay, cool. So I'll start if that's okay. Well, we'd probably try and do it in order of, of actually the episodes. And the first one actually is a clip from the first episode of season two, which was with a, a, a lovely chap called um, called Kevin Duncan, who has had written has written a number of amazing books, um, and um, we were talking particularly to him about smart strategy, uh, which was one of the books that he had had put together. And this is uh, this is how Kevin Duncan dis- described strategy for us. So when it comes to my definition of strategy. I'm actually very much a debunker. I will not accept a 47 page definition of what apparently strategy is. In my opinion, strategy is just when you've decided what to do. That's it. Nice. <laughs> now, sounds almost crassly simplistic, almost facile, but really, if you look at all the definitions of it, strategy is just a posh word to make people in business who are a bit underconfident think that they're doing something more intelligent and important because strategy somehow linguistically sounds way more elevated and lofty than tactics, which sound bit in short term. Yeah? But really a yes, strategy is what you've decided to do. So that's my definition of it. And so throughout this thing, what I'm pointing out is there's way too much waffle attached to the discipline and the more of it you have, the less you and your teams have got any idea what you're really trying to do. And you've all been in these multidisciplinary joint meetings and someone says, well, it's clearly one of these three of those, four of those and so on. And there's a lot of hot air and jargony stuff. And you walk out of it thinking, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing with this. I don't know what the direction is at all. I'll invent something probably. (laughs) So that's the sort of backdrop to it. (laughs) So, that is a classic Kevin Duncan, very dry, very brutal in his approach. To me, he speaks a lot of sense. You know, strategy is, uh, is, is when you've decided on what to do. What do you think about that, Jacob? That, you know, is an opening clip. It's a perfect choice to start with, you know, defining strategy. And, you know, Kevin just says how it is. And I, I, I loved his approach. And that was one of my favorite episodes. I think I'm going to say that for all of our episodes. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, he, that's a brilliant episode to go back on to. And he's, like I said, he's got some amazing books to check out as well. So. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things I I, I, um, I really appreciated about that episode was when he went through a load of really really useful strategic tools that you can use in your brand strategy work. And in fact, 
there's one I, I, I um, he talked about called the the market map. And here he is talking about that just to kind of give you, the listener, a little insight into that episode and, and how valuable it could be for you. So the one you were mentioning earlier, the gap in the market. Hmm. Now, I call this the market map, and this is the strategist's arguably best friend ever in the world. Now, I'm going to quickly describe it verbally, but it is visual, which is, makes it a little harder on a podcast, but let's give it a go. So if people can imagine one vertical straight line and then one horizontal one going across it, so it's a little bit like a crucifix, but both lines are of equal length. Okay. And you would choose two important parameters in whatever the market is or brand that you're dealing with. So to give a rubbish example, you might, if you're dealing with cars, you might have fuel economy, good, bad. You might have style, good, bad, family, saloon, whatever. You can work out those parameters easily enough. Mm. And then as a strategist, what you're going to want to do is plot your brand on the map. So it's becoming a market map already. Yeah. Now, just by putting the brand on the map, it means that you as the brand strategist have to have an, a reasonable working idea of what this brand does indeed stand for. So that's step number one. If you then do it with all the other brands in the market, suddenly you've got a market map. Now, in that, you can't fill that chart in if you don't know what you're talking about. Or if you're working in a team, you're going to have a massive discussion with your mate. So if you and Jacob, for example, were filling that thing in and you said, right, put Volvo on the map. And you'd say, well, it clearly goes here. And he'll say, you're an idiot. No, it doesn't. It goes down here. And, you're, and suddenly you're having a strategic discussion, but you didn't even intend to. If you repeat that with all the other brands in the market, stick Fiat on the map, you know, stick Mazda on the map, stick everything, you have to debate that entire market fast and furious with your colleagues and you can generate that market map usually in less than 10 minutes I, w I would just say that jacob would still probably call me an idiot even if i had all that tied down <laughs> <laughs> so um little clip of the banter that we sometimes have but i mean what an amazing uh, description of a, of a really super powerful tool i've actually used that tool a few times in my work over the last sort of few months and it is amazing what do you think of that clip jacob listening to it back I think it ended well. <laughs> Your witty banter again. Uh, yeah, that I also use a very similar tool as well. It's a pretty classic one, you know, competitive mapping, and you know, it's very powerful. If you haven't used that before, definitely look it up because it is a good way to find the, the gap in the market. And it's not always, I think there was a good analogy. I don't know if it's in that episode, but you know, it's not always about finding the gap because sometimes there's a gap in the market for a reason, right? So I think there's, I don't know who said it was one of our guests, but you know, the hot coffee analogy, or you looked at the gap in the market, there's hot coffee and there's cold coffee. So let's serve like warm <laughs> like <laughs> coffee. So it's not always about finding that gap because it's not always valid. So I think that's a good point to, to mark on that. A very, a very good point. A very good point. But yeah, hopefully it would, it, it shows though, um, just a little snippet from that episode, episode one, definitely tuck into that one. Uh, Duncan shares tons more tools uh, and ideas. So, so there's our first one. I think that I think that's a hopefully a good start. I hope you find that quite interesting. You're getting a whirlwind tour of the whole of the series here. So we're going to dive straight into the second one, and the second one is another one of mine actually. So the second one was, and it's with the second episode, I think, was was with an amazing lady called Denise Yong. Denise is is quite famous. She's written a number of of best selling books. And we sat down to talk with her about one of her latest books, which was called Fusion, Brand Culture Fusion. And she's talking a lot about how you take brand, which she defines as sort of appearing externally, and you bring that and build a culture around it internally in organizations. So really, really insightful and interesting episode. And um, here she is talking about her transition to, to basically going uh, solo as a solo consultant. And I think this is quite an interesting uh, clip for those of you that are on that journey. Yeah, yeah, no, my, my experience was very similar. You know, I always say that when you go out into business on your own, you end up wearing three hats. One hat is all of the like administrative and like technology stuff. So yeah, like when your printer breaks, you don't just call IT and say, hey, fix my printer. You like get underneath the, 
<laughs> like figure it out. Um, or you call on your husband, which is what I normally do. <laughs> um, the second issue here is business development. And to your point, that is it's very difficult for a lot of people um, to, you know, if you've never had a sales role before, which I really technically hadn't, um, it's very difficult to get to use this idea that like you, you eat what you chill or whatever they say in sales. And so, you know, you're responsible for making your business. And then the third how you wear is the actual work that you want to do, like the, mm -hmm. the content and, and all of the strategy and everything. But, you know, if you don't wear those first two hats, you won't be able to do the last one. And so you really have to be okay with that. What do you think of that, Jacob? Three hats uh, of a solo uh, consultant, solo freelancer. She said admin, business development and work. What are your thoughts on that? As I know you, you and both of us work solo, but what are your thoughts on that? I would say there's more hats than that, definitely. <laughs> there's a few more. <laughs> yes, I've got a whole hat rack in my cupboard. <laughs> I mean, a whole rack of hats, I should say. But um, yeah, I loved her approach to brand and culture, and she was a very unique um, speaker to come on to our show. And I, I loved how she is talking about you know the, the next level of brand and how it integrates inside of, of a, a business. And I think so so many of us focus on you know just the visuals and. Uh, kind of miss the next level up when it comes to brand building. And I think those the strongest brands do have a very strong culture that actually aligns with the brand. So I really loved her, you know, how she spoke about it and how she brings culture into brand and you know influences these larger companies. Awesome. Let's just let let's just hear what she had to say, just a very tiny slip uh, small small clip around exactly what you've just talked about. Now the problem is that a lot of culture building tends to be focused in like one direction only. And that is, you know, everyone kind of gets this impression that you need to have a like kind of a friendly, fuzzy, nice, warm, nurturing organizational culture. But that's just not true. Like every organization is different. Every brand is different. And so every culture needs to be different as well. You know, you don't just want to produce happy employees. You want to have your employees produce the specific results you're looking for. And so that's why you need to align your brand identity, like what you hope to stand for in the world, with how you actually run your company so that you actually can get to that desired identity. And so that's why the, the fusion of brand and culture is so important. So as Jacob's just said, guys, get into that episode. Um, it does bring you into the next level of brand strategy. Um, and you can see already, hopefully just with those first two, the breadth of our podcast in this series, you know, first of all, dealing with hardcore strategy, then dealing with culture. Um, we kind of um, segued back into in, in episode three into perhaps more creative space with, uh, with, with Lisa Hastings. Do you remember her, the Australian? Uh, well, she was a British Australian. She had a very strong, yeah, she was awesome. She was a proper powder keg of uh of, of thinking, um, and she was talking to us about creative bravery, and here she is. So and in terms of bravery, I've got a little bit of a written down note here. So it's the quality and state of showing mental or moral strength to face danger, fear, or difficulty. Um, so I guess to me, like bravery is like, and I've recently done a podcast with this um, on this kind of topic of risk with Mark actually, but more in terms of drawing up examples. So it's not recklessness, it's not taking opportunities, um, but it's more about facing danger. Like it's a, it's a sensibility of courage to me. So there she is talking about creative bravery. That was a really interesting episode as well. Um, Lisa, top of her game, running creative teams, running, uh, you know, brand strategy in and amongst um, delivering, you know, massive, massive uh, kind of rebrands for, for very large clients. And uh, it's amazing to hear her talk about bravery uh, in this space. Um, what do you what did you make of that episode, Jacob? Yeah, I think being courageous with your, your work, not just design work, but you know, how you approach brand and um, you know working with clients and actually pushing them to go beyond I think you know, a lot of focus in that episode was about that like how do you actually help the client to go to the next level push further go, go be a little bit more brave and you know, I think she really nailed that episode and it kind of leads into our next uh, clip which is from Natalie Nixon which we focus on well uh, creativity and innovation so we'll see how that is applied and I think about creativity as our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems and also produce novel value at scale. And wonder is about 
awe and audacity and asking big blue sky what if questions. It's also about pausing. Rigor is about time on task. It's about discipline, um, incessant practice. It's often very solitary. It's not particularly sexy. And it is an equally essential aspect of creativity. The reason why it's super important for us to be thinking about creativity in a business context is that most businesses that I work with are trying to build cultures of innovation. Um, but what I often find is that they throw around the word innovation quite a bit and are not necessarily speaking the same language. We don't have a, really a good lingua franca for how we think about innovation. And by the way, I, I, I define innovation as invention converted into value. And that might be social value, financial value, cultural value. But at the end of the day, creativity is that conversion factor. It's creativity that converts an invention, an idea into a scalable idea. But we have to actually start with creativity before we even get about the business of innovation because creativity is the engine for innovation. It's how we get to interesting and cool inventions that we can eventually scale. Well, there you have it from Natalie Nixton. She has a whole book on creativity called Creativity Leap. Uh, goes into much more detail about using creativity to lead to innovation. And you know, innovation is one of those words that gets thrown around a lot, as she's I mentioned, you know, but when you actually dive deeper into the, the company and you ask them about, well, how much money you put in towards innovation, it's generally nothing at all. <laughs> or they're just throwing it around saying we have a, you know, we have a team that's working on innovation, but it's not actually doing anything new. So I'm curious to your thoughts on that, Matt. Yeah, I think I think both of those clips that you you know we've just looked at the one with Lisa and the one with uh, Natalie were, were were the episodes were super inspirational because they both touched on on this idea of bravery and leaping into the unknown, which is what creativity is, right? Because if you've got a new idea um, and you've you, you know it's new, it's it's fresh, it's going to scare the heck out of people, and that's. You know that is what in a you know really fuels that innovation. That the, the trick is how do you bring other people on on the journey with you? How do you test that that's useful and you're not just inventing, you know, uh, as you as you referred to earlier, you know, lukewarm coffee because that's not that fun. So, it both of those episodes were brilliant in relation to that. And I think you're right. Businesses really struggle with innovation. Um, and the reason, I mean, I think we touched on this in those episodes. I think the reason for that is that there is this kind of fear around the new, fear around the unknown, fear around, um, you know, not doing things like they've always been done because, you know, you kind of feel safe in that zone. So I always think that, you know, innovation doesn't happen by accident. You know, you've got to create that space, create that thinking, design and, uh, and uh, the way forward so that you are producing new ideas, new thinking um, from the micro to the macro, you know, and you really need to, as you say, invest in that, Jacob. So definitely check out those episodes if you're if you're struggling with a with a brand problem around innovation. When you if you're becoming stagnant and you need a little bit of a boost, those are great episodes to kind of um, to kind of kickstart some creative thinking um, uh, in, in your work. Yeah. And moving into the, the next clip is from um, Jacqueline Lieberman, and we actually speak about brand building mistakes. I think it's a good segue into that. Uh, this particular clip is uh, about purpose, and let's dive into it. Why shouldn't we be doing this? Why shouldn't every year, like we do with a marketing plan for the next year and our business imperatives or whatever we do, why shouldn't we be like, oh, well, let's let's rethink our brand purpose and vision, mission, and values every year? Why Why not? Well, I mean, it's kind of like saying to yourself, uh, you know, let, I'm going to change my personality for 2021. I'm just going to, you know, you know, randomly be a completely different person than I am now. And I'm going to expect all of my family and friends to still love me and respect me because I'm going to have completely different viewpoints and personality and behavior. Uh, and I expect no one to blink because of that. And that's what a it. brand does, you know essentially there you go that episode actually goes more into other brand building mistakes um you know talking about purpose and values and uncovering brand truths and brand management so there's a lot more value in that episode but i think you know what is your take on you know mistakes when it comes to brand building what are some other mistakes that companies make well, I, I, I often find that a mis um, one of the biggest mistakes is, is the leadership team don't engage with the wider organization. 
And I think that that they therefore sometimes struggle to get buy-in. Now, I'm not saying that therefore you should talk to everybody and get, you know, committees designing and thinking through all of the, you know, the big the big brand strategy questions and then out into market. You know, you don't want committees to, 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 to be making all the decisions. But when it comes to kind of things like purpose or values, things like that, I think you need to connect that deep within the culture. And if you don't carry people with you, then you can sometimes very much, and I see it a lot, you know, struggle to get the engagement levels that you need. So I'm always an advocate of listening, setting up listening posts, setting up uh, ways of sort of cascading information and helping people come up with, you know, at least feel that they're listened to and, and should be listened to genuinely to factor into the process. But then leaders ultimately make the call. I think if that approach is taken, that's, you know, you don't get this problem of of, of, of such a disconnect sometimes, as you can see in some organizations. So there's one. How about you, Jacob? Any, any ones that you kind of sort of see happen from time to time? Uh, both definitely. Most people, well, jump ahead straight into the identity and working on the visuals and they, they skip so many of the important internal factors when it comes to brand building. You know, the substance, the mission, vision, values and the positioning, looking at your customers and your competitors and, you know, what makes you different? Why is someone going to choose you? So, so many people just skip all of this and often, you know, much to their detriment, it can, you know, really slow down their growth. So that's definitely why we're here, right, as strategists to help with them, uh, help businesses and brands you know, program to the strategic way. So let's segue into, you know, I think it's Nathan Hendricks. Uh, yeah, well, Nathan's episode was was absolutely mind blowing. At least I found it. Um, so Nathan Hendricks is the chief creative officer at the global agency LPK. He was an absolute honor to have on the show, and he talked to us uh, in depth around one of the tools that he uses, which is a, a framework around the sixteen basic human desires. So this is him uh, talking to us and introducing that idea. The reason I, I discovered them is because I was struggling with the kind of information that I was getting out of focus groups and just the kind of lack of either truthfulness or literally the ability for people to kind of talk truthfully about, you know, why they were buying things, why they were in certain categories. And so um, desires really are um, part of a, a framework that was developed by Professor Stephen Rees. Uh, and this framework is one that I came across uh, probably about 10 years ago by now. But he describes and defines desires as um, highly ingrained, universal needs, wants, or cravings. And when I saw that language, that word universal was really important to me just because we work on a number of different brands uh, at LPK. Many of them are global brands. And I think anybody who works on a global brand knows what a trick that is to make that brand work well in North America as well as it does in South America or, or um, Shanghai or whatever. So there's him introducing the, the, the concept and this idea of, uni, of universal principle. Um, and he references that the framework was originally uh, produced by this uh, or discovered and, and defined by uh, Stephen Rees, a psychologist. And it really is a fascinating episode. He goes through in the episode. We're not going to do it now. Uh, because we, you know, we can't give you all, we can't give everything away. You've got to go back into it and find it, guys. I mean, come on. But yeah, he goes into each of those 16 basic desires and explains how you can use them in your work. I found them particularly in, uh, particularly helpful when building like audience personas for brands, when you're looking at, well, what is it that this uh, brand, who is it that this brand is seeking to serve? And what, you know, what is it that that group is really after? Because it really hones your thinking the messaging, the positioning, um, and and the ability to kind of build a strategic alignment around where to where to kind of focus. So fantastic tool, really really helpful, um, and and one I found really useful. How did you find that episode, Jacob? Yeah, I loved it. When I hear of frameworks that uh, are new, and I'm always blown away. Like when I first heard about brand archetypes, or like from Carl Jung, and you know when I heard about this framework and you know that studies, and there's also another one which Bill Gardner we're going to talk about in the next clip. It's a different framework. And like you said, it, it does really help with the brand's personality and persona. And these desires, they're, they're often you know, within us. And people, we only talk about the surface level 
uh, wants, right? We never talk about our internal desires and this kind of goes deeper. And that's what strategy is about, is going deeper and uncovering those fears, wants, and desires. And that is how you're actually going to connect with customers in the a, in a, in a long run to help grow your brand. So the more you know about them, and the more you can connect with them, the better you're, you're going to be. So I think that was a great framework to share from Nathan. And uh, I, let's get into Bill's clip because he talked about uh, a different framework. Yeah, let's hear from Bill. Within brands, there are basically five different personalities. And those are five different personality dimensions. And if I were to list those categories up top, the categories are sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, and ruggedness. Hmm. Okay, that's, that's kind of an odd mix. You're kind of going, oh, wow, is that the only five? But, but keep in mind, those are dimensions. So think of those as five buckets up top. And within each bucket, there are trait words that are associated with each of those dimensions. So sincerity, for example. Um, if I were to look in that bucket of trait words, I would find words like authentic, original, family. These, these are words that, you know, um, have to do with somebody giving their word, a warm feeling of family within sincerity. You can kind of see that, you know, kind of filling out. And there's probably a dozen different word trait words associated with that. And there's about a dozen associated with each of those. And what we do is we literally go in to a, uh, a group of stakeholders in a uh, company, uh, whether it is those in charge of the company or whether it's their clients or whether it is potential clients or you know, uh, board members or employees. And we have a survey that we go through that asks a lot of questions. But amongst those, it says, which of these words do you associate with your company? Fill in the blank. And by circling those trait words, we can identify brand-wise which of those five buckets you most land in. And I, I will tell you that very few companies are just one of any one of those dimensions. And oftentimes you'll find that they fall into one or two or sometimes three. You don't really want to press it beyond that because it starts to, you know, uh, uh, become a camel. You know, it, it's not well designed and everybody's, you know, trying to get in there. I love Bill. He's uh, got a lot of uh, humor. He's a magician. He's also a founder of an agency and runs Logo Lounge, which is a brilliant logo database. But you know, the personality framework he was talking about there was from Jennifer Arker um, called The Five Dimensions of Brand Personalities, if you want to look at that further. But yeah, in this episode with Bill, we talk about logos versus brands and dive into you know, brands um, with the um, blend of personality. So go check out that episode if that um, interests you. So moving into the next clip, we have Jose Caliber. And I'm butchering that name, so please do give me a now, in this episode, we talk about innovation and you know, discovery and big picture thinking and drive. So we're going to jump into this one. Oh, unless, <laughs> Matt, I'll totally forgot about you. Do you want to comment on that? No, no, no. Don't worry. And, uh, you know, hey, folks, if this is still playing, like, this is how I'm treated. Okay? Okay? <laughs> so let's just leave that in just so that everyone knows really how I'm treated. Um, anyway, let's go, into, let's go into Jose's episode now. <laughs> Where do you think that innovation spark comes from? What are you training people in to, to come up with that new stuff, that new experience, that new, that new product? Um, and do you have anything to, to, sort of, to sort of share with us on innovation and, uh, and that in regards to brand? Yeah, I can only speak to it from my own experience. But the first thing I'll say is that you guys are a perfect example of that. People who are willing to like move forward and do their thing, right? Like, you know, just not having any, uh, not caring, right? You know. Uh, the rebels, the uh, the big picture thinkers, the healers, the feelers, you know, the people who are like, you know what, nah. um, But Susan Griffith Black, the, C, the, the co-founder of uh, EO Products uh, with Brad Black, who's her other co-founder and then the new CEO, uh, Tom. So about Susan specifically, I, I've learned so much from, from my clients who are powerful creators, you know, because ultimately she's the creator. And just watching her like, interact with the world um and with businesses it was just a 
a privilege be a big school. Um, people like Christo, like, you know, people like me, um, you know, almost like this dogged, like, the world devil may care, like, just do it, right? Uh, Nike does it best, right? Just do it. Um, I just brand, you know, I just got that. <laughs> <laughs> I am so slow. I love that episode. Jose is a unique character, and you know, I love you know, his creative energy. And he goes on these like tangents with, um, and then comes back to what he was talking about. It was a really, um, you know, awesome episode that went into brand discovery and you know innovation, and really you know being a pirate and doing things your way. And you know, I loved how he spoke spoke to Chris and himself. And you know, I think they're perfect examples of you know people uh, that are actually leading the way right through drive and motivation and passion and Jose is actually bringing out a whole new system that is going to help creatives you know um, actually create more impact in the world so go check out those days the system it's literally called the system uh, and he's really flipping the whole approach to creative thinking and innovation on its head and you know it's, it's super exciting to see him do that so um, what are your thoughts on innovation now? Well, well, I just wanted to, to 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 say that that episode was phenomenal, and it, you know the, he's definitely a off the wall thinker. But I particularly appreciate the fact that he 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 said that we, you little you and little me, Jacob, that we. Yeah, that's why I put this clip in. I know. I bet you still. I bet you spent hours trying to find someone giving us a random compliment, but we found <laughs> one and we put it in. And he said that we were examples of innovators and rebels. And I, you know, I I definitely think I might be there, but you know, I question his his judgment around you, to be frank. But you know, we we, we get there in there. No, but it was amazing. You know, ser- in, on a serious note, I think he was sat in his kitchen when we were interviewing him, which was really funny. And um, yeah, it was it was just a, such a good. A good, a good, a good episode. Innovation, you know, we've touched on it already in in in, in our recap, but he approached it very differently, I would say, to the typical way of, of thinking about it from a creative perspective. And his models and structures just blew my mind. So definitely check that episode out. Definitely, definitely. And you know, that kind of segues into Sagi Habib, who was he's an amazing um, identity designer, logo designer, uh, and it was a pleasure to have him on the show. Uh, a real fanboy over here. And, you know, we're talking about problem solving and strategy. And this little clip is um, about strategy. When you talk about strategy, when we're done with these interviews, we put together a list of criteria. Success criteria. What are we looking for? This is defining the problem together. Once we put on the success criteria, we meet with a client, we look at them, and we arrive at an agreement. So that, okay. What type of personality are we, are we looking for? What is the functionality challenges? Does it need to look local or global? Does it need to feel friendly or does it need to feel serious? What, you know, that, you know how important is it that it can work in any color? What, you know, what is the kind of attitude that we would like to project? All these things are important because then every option that we show will Check all the boxes. So it's not about showing you options for the sake of options. It's about showing you options that all fulfill the criteria. And then you have a great choice between good and great. Right? Then it's all about which one fits like a glove. I love that approach. And I think that really comes back to what we do is actually defining the problem first and actually getting to the root cause of the problem, not just what the client uh, specifies as the problem and then going into execute. So, yeah, and I love their approach with all well, their philosophy when it comes to you know, building a brand. They're, they actually, sorry, you went to, into it in more uh, depth on the episode, but they, they build in from the trademark out, but they, they focus on you know, the logo or the trademark, as they call it, and then build around that in their philosophy. But before that, they've actually properly defined the brief. Right? So that's something that was a crucial point to point out here. So, uh, Matt, what's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely amazing. And I think if you have that approach of basically you're looking for what's the problem, you know, and 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 I think as a strategist, you're you're looking at that in two levels, right? You're looking at at it from the perspective of what's the what's the client's problem? That's that's one thing. Uh, and then you're looking at what is their customer's problem. And those two things are a little bit different, right? Because one could be an internal challenge or personalities or a leadership issue or, you know, they just don't know how to get from A to B. 
Um, so that could be the, the client's problem, but their customer's problem could be something completely different. And, and so sort of having those two um, angles in mind, I think are really, really important to think strategically about any particular brand challenge. You might know the customer problem, but you still have to, uh, you know, and, and you might even know how to solve it, but you still have to navigate the internal uh, client problem. You might know your client's problem uh, and know how to kind of get around that. But again, you might now still need to then do some work to uncover your their customer's problem. So it is all about problems. Strategy is all about solving problems, uh, which is why I love it. Um, and, uh, but it, and, it, and it's always not necessarily following a, a particular template, which is what that episode is all about, which is, which is awesome. Yeah, and there's some case studies that he goes through in, in that episode. You know, uh, one that comes to mind is the US Open and what that means to people, right? Is it the US mm -hmm. Open or is it US Golf Open? And navigating that particular problem and how he solved that problem you know, through design thinking and interviews and so forth. So that's you know, a really great episode to, to tune into. I think the next one was perhaps, I mean, you've, we, I, I've probably said this already, but it was one of my favorites. It was one of my favorites. I got a bit. Um, it was with the, the, the very interesting Joe Pine, right? And Joe Pine um, wrote um, The Experience Economy, uh, the book, uh, which basically is relatively old now, I think, Jacob. I think it's almost 10 years old. I love how you look around for your books every time. Like, I know, because I kind of, I, I, you know, I was like, let me, uh, yeah. let me just look <laughs> my book. Um, yeah, li li uh, people listening and watching can't see me doing that because we, I've got my, my on-brand uh, Zoom background on. But yeah, I have tons of books all around me. I'm surrounded by books. Um, but the, 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 the thing that's amazing about the experience economy, and, and even though it is, you know, uh, as a concept around has been around for, for a few years. What's wonderful is it's such a universal principle, almost like Nathan Hendricks uh, uh, kind of comments around the, the human desires. Um, but let's just have I've got two small clips that I want to play us um, because Joe Pine really blew my mind. So here he is uh, explaining the experience economy. Well, it's, it's important for everybody to understand what's going on with experiences because we have shifted to this experience economy. So probably best if I start off by describing the core framework of our book, The Experience Economy, is what we call the progression of economic value and defines how economic value has changed over millennia, actually, because it starts with the agrarian economy where we, we grow things on the ground, raise them on the ground, or pull out them on the ground, and sell them on the open marketplace. Right? That's the basis of the agrarian economy that lasted for millennia. Then thanks to the industrial revolution, we shifted into an industrial economy based off physical goods. We use commodities as a raw material to make or manufacture uh, physical, tangible things for, for the, you know, the standardized marketplace that's out there. Then in the latter half of the 20th century, we shifted into a service economy where services became the predominant economic offering, right? Overtook goods just as goods overtook uh, commodities. And now we have, you know, have shifted into an experience economy. When the book first came out in 1999, we talked about the nascent experience economy, the forthcoming experience economy. Now you can tell it's here, right? It's here. Yeah. The people want experiences over things. They want, they recognize we're sort of at peak stuff. And in fact, the, the Corona crisis, as we call it, has probably caused people to understand that, that even more so that they prefer experiences over things because we're missing them so much. Right? We're missing the experiences that we, that we can't have right now. And we recognize this experiences, as research shows, like purchasing experiences make people happier than buying things. But it's also what you said, Matt, it's, it is about meaning. That it's, that's the experiences we have with our loved ones that give life meaning. And, uh, and therefore, we want those. And so, so we have shifted an economy where experiences are the predominant economic offering. And experiences are it's crucial to understand because we, we write this as clearly as we can in the book, but still some people, particularly in UX, CX sort of field, right, branding probably too, don't get this, which is that experiences are a distinct economic offering. Well, we get that, I think, and, um, and hopefully anyone that listens to that that episode will. I just find his approach just so interesting, you know, to build value, to, to, to play you know, and, and, and basically, obviously, if you're creating value, you, you can create profits. You've got to think about your brand from the perspective of the experience that it produces um, in, and the feelings and the, and the, and the, the sort of the, um, the, the benefits that that gives to your audience. And, and so that episode 
was absolutely awesome. He he just want just before um, I come to your thoughts, uh, Jacob. There's another short short clip which I just think adds so much value because he talks about the benefit of thinking about um, brands in this space and the fact that if you think about it from an experience perspective, you can really distinguish your brand from other brands that are kind of trying to to, to solve the same problems. So just hear him out. And, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on that episode in just a second, David. Right, commoditization means you don't have any differentiation, that you are the same as everybody else, that people want to buy you on price. And that's what companies have to constantly fight because commoditization is like the law of gravity. If you do nothing over time, you're going to be commoditized. You have to proactively counteract that to be differentiated. And that's the key thing um, that you're talking about is how do you be differentiated uh, and avoid that, uh, that commoditization trap? What did you make of that episode? Oh man, I, lo- I love that. And it's, it's very clear that he's said that uh, talk many, many times <laughs> about the customer experience. But you know, it's so true about the corona crisis and how you know, it has amplified our expectations on experiences. And for me, like, you know, being in lockdown and our experiences have changed. You know, like we're having like family Zoom chats, like wine tasting on Zoom, right, with the family. You know, that we're trying to get that connection back in some way or another because we can't see each other. But more on a brand, you know, brand level or service provider such as myself, like how can we provide a better experience for our customers, right? To make this a little bit more tangible, like, how do we elevate our brand experience for our customers, right? So if you think about the customer journey, it starts at, you know, the first touch point. How can you elevate that experience? You know, make it high end, for example. How can you build that trust? How can you, you know, elevate the experience? And to do that is by surprising delighting at every single touch point of the, the journey, you know, just over delivering and, you know, um, presenting and, you know, giving it, giving you all. So some examples of that are like little touch, touch points like, you know, sending a coffee card at the beginning or, you know, like a gift at the end of the project or like a closing um, guide or, you know, a, a bonus in some way. So these are some tangible examples of how you can elevate uh, a customer experience and, you know, think about it. How can you elevate your customer's experience? And the other comment, the last clip, you know, differentiation. I think there are so many different ways you can differentiate. And one of them is by you know, creating a higher end experience for the customer. So how can, how can you do that? I guess is my point. Just think about it, Jacob. That's such an awesome, you know, you know, knowledge bomb that you've just sort of set off there. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. I, you know, I often look at. Um, so I do a lot of workshops, as as probably listeners will know. And you know, there's so many new platforms coming onto the market. I was looking at Butter the other day, um, which allows you to create, you know, sound um, and and add a completely different experience. Everything in in one kind of window, rather than maybe having you know different windows for different things open. And you, you know, everything is about experience. And and so I often think, I often sometimes think it is like a little bit like putting a show on. Sometimes you've got to be mildly entertaining. Um, but you have to watch that because obviously you need the results at the end of it. So as long as the focus is on results, um, you know, I, you know, listeners will know that I always say stupid things and laugh at myself all day long. But, you know, sometimes that can be a good thing if the client connects with that and if that's kind of helpful to get us to the destination and everybody has a good time getting there. But, yeah, I, I'm often looking at, you know, the, the experience that I'm delivering um, in my consultancy work for all my clients, um, you know, routines of how often I check in, what I, you know, playbacks after, you know, different sessions, stuff like that, you know, it's the little details and and making sure that you're communicating in a way that that particular client can digest and, and, and find useful, um, I, I think is, is, is important. So attention to detail and, and personalization where possible, I think is, is, is crucial. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a really good point, and this, this often doesn't get talked about because it's behind the scenes, right? It's basically customer experience, and well, it is customer experience. Uh, so how can you how can you improve it? Right? This is everything behind the scenes. So it's not what you get to see in other businesses. So it's really up to you to, you know, jot out all the touch points that you have with your customers and see how you can add extra surprise and delight and over deliver every single touch point. Because the benefits of that, it means that you're going to get more referrals and you know they're going to have a better experience and, uh, and much more. But let's leave it there unless you have another comment, Matt. We have... Well, it was, it was just one thought I just uh, that came to mind. The, the, I, I remember I was working for an agency once and they used to, um, when they have an, an important client coming in for a meeting, they used to phone up the secretary of that 
CEO or you know chief marketing officer. Find out the football club because in the UK football's like the thing, right? Find out the football club or the whatever the sports club that that particular person was really interested in, and then make sure that that they bought a mug with that team you know plastered all over it so when the when, when they show, showed up someone said oh do you want a coffee yeah you want a you know tea coffee or whatever they brought it in uh the mug of their favorite football team such a stupid well, stupid such a, such a simple kind of almost seemingly insignificant thing but it always you know kicked off the meeting to such a such an interesting kind of uh, discussion point the ice was broken immediately and uh, they're like whoa how do you know this about me and then obviously there's a whole conversation oh we always do it for important people and off you go so yeah just i love what you just said about you know doing the customer experience mapping in your own practice you know eating your own dog meat as as the expression might be um you know if you advise your you know your your clients to build brands around experiences what experience are you doing so br- brilliant advice there sorry next next one well you touched on the mugs there because we we actually oh, yeah. now guess personalized mugs and the yeah. it, it goes like I, I still see people using it in their, their instagram stories you know it sits on their desk and it's just that little touch right and if you think about going to hotels for example you know sometimes you get a, a special gift like we were on an anniversary we got some little socks for our um Baby, or we're on a baby moon we've got some little socks for the, the baby you know, you know get some personalized um gifts and it just goes so so far and it's it's imprinted in your in your mind so what can you do to over deliver and um yeah that's the experience but enough on that let's go into uh emily cohen's episodes so emily cohen is an, an amazing author and i don't think she likes using the word coach but a consultant that helps you know business creative businesses grow so she has a book that is on no bullshit strategies to grow business and uh, we talk about specialization and niching which is uh, an area that a lot of creatives struggle with or a lot of industries struggle with is how to specialize how to niche down so let's um dive into this clip i think really what specialization is, is really landing on an industry or a few industries. So I really try to get them. I will but say not social that good branding. They're not social good. <laughs> I mean, you can go deeper in social good. Like, you know, I, I've really had some luck because I, I love social good. Like I care about the world just like everybody else. Cause it's, you know, I don't want to curse, but I will say it's <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think it's all really good, but that, that doesn't make you an expert anymore because everybody does that. And everybody says they do that. And it's like also restaurants, like everybody says they do restaurant branding, but everybody does that. And so it's really hard to win work based on that because, so I like to go deeper. Is there some kind of like um, social good that you, you know, are specially, like I have one client that might be looking at like, um, I don't want to give it away, but you know, I, I try to have them have certain industries that they care more deeply about than others so that they can become even a deeper expert in an area of social good that really resonates with them and that they have some experience for. Um, and we just do the pros and cons, like what works in this industry, what doesn't. Every, every industry has pros and every industry has cons. So we just have to weigh what you care most about and what you can communicate. So I typically like to land on two or three industries and usually two, two of them are like ones you've already in or you have some proven proven work in and one can be really fun and new and different or one that's kind of cool that just makes your staff and everybody happy right but it might not be the most profitable so there's always i always try to include an element of joy and fun in the positioning and then the writing of it is always i always tell people not to have a writer write their positioning i really think writing should be authentic to you and you should you and your team should write the writing so you know write the positioning so it really sounds like I'm sure you've been to a million creative sites as you know, podcast and you've met all these people. After a while, the voice all sounds the same because they have this beautiful crafted, you know, writer write this stuff. And then, but it doesn't sound real. I kind of like the positioning that's much more authentic and really sounds like somebody wrote it, like a human being. Yeah, I love how Emily just says it how it is, and you know, it's, it's right to the point. Her whole book is is like that as well, and you know it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. It's you know, printed in nine different colors, um, and it's one one to get for your bookshelf for sure. 
Um, so what are your thoughts on, on that, Matt? Yeah, I mean, what she just said there was absolutely spot on. I think, you know, this is the thing when you design by committee too much, you know, all of the expressions and the wording and the, the phraseology can get absolutely hammered out into basically nothingness. And she talks about there about expressing it in, in human language, in, in real language that people, you know, on your on your shop floor or you know, in your warehouse will actually you know, language that they'll actually use and connect with and understand. Um, and that kind of goes back to um, to what Kevin Duncan was saying, which is like, you know, everything's filled with jargon, you know. And I think one of our jobs is, and it's so hard, it's so hard to do, is to kind of strip out the jargon and talk like people actually talk, be that customers, be that internally in your in your, in your your company culture. So I loved her approach. She was so... Um, uh, yeah, we've had quite a few brutal guests, if I can put it that on. They just say it how it is, um, which is fantastic because that's, uh, you know, it cuts it cuts through and it gets to the point and it gives us some real value um, in, the, in their thinking. So, yeah, she, she, was, she was a hot one, to be sure. 100%. And niching is such a, a big subject. And I, I know Emily just focused on the industry there, but I do want to say there's so many other different ways to, to niche down. So it doesn't just have to be by industry. I think that's one very solid approach. Um, but... Some valid points about you know social good, and that's what my comment there was about. It's like uh, earlier in the episode, she's, she said that everyone says they're so, they're doing branding for social good, and everyone says they're doing branding. So like, okay, but how do you stand out when everyone's saying they're doing social good and doing branding? Like, okay, well everyone's doing that. How do you stand out? All right. So something to think about. Um, cool. Well, let's talking about um, cutting straight through. I think this segues on a. This is Carl Miller's next one. I was going to say Julian Cole. He also demystifies strategy, but that's the next clip. So we'll jump into. Uh, you jump in the head. You jump in the gun, Jacob. You jump in yeah, the gun yeah. because um, you know. Let let let's let's get there. But let's let's first of all let's not let's not jump over uh, uh, Carl Miller. Carl, I I actually had um, worked with him um, in a in a corporate job a while ago, and his episode was really interesting because we sat down with him to talk to him about internal corporate. Uh, brand strategy work, um, running big corporate teams um, and figuring out, you know, finding from somebody, a leader in, in, in the corporate world, how the big brands, you know, think about and manage their brand strategies and their brand execution. And he had some really interesting things to say. I've got a few clips from him, which I really wanted to sort of replay and, and remind ourselves on. The first was, was it was kind of an off the wall one because we asked all of our guests, like, how do you define strategy? And I found his response quite interesting. So listen to Carl, first of all, define it. And then I've got a couple of other clips around org design and a couple of other things that he shared with us. But listen to this one. One of the things I always talk about with the brand when it comes to my teams or, or my agencies that I work with is a, a brand is very much like, like a friendship. Um, as a brand, you kind of act a certain, a certain way. And that consumer will decide that they like you or not because of, of what you do. Uh, when you're trying to make a new friend, you don't go up to a new friend and, or a new person and say, hey, I want to be your friend. How should I act so you and I can be friends? That's, that's crazy. No one would do that. You just kind of act. And then if your values align, that's kind of how, you be, how a friendship forms, right? And it's very much the same with the, with the brand. You are authentic in yourself. You show what you stand for and the why. And then once again, people, people like that. Uh, and it's the same goes for afterwards when you become friends and you ask somebody, well, why do you like this person? You won't say, oh, I like it because they wear the color red. No one says that, right? But a lot of ideas of brands are like, oh, the, the color red is really empowering. It, it is. It's, it's, it's a great way to help, you know, show who you are, but it's not the reason why. The reason why is, is because of, once again, who you are. It comes, it, everything comes back to, to that why, that purpose. Um, and that and that connection standpoint. So when you ask a friend why you like them, oh, they're trustworthy, or I can they make me laugh. Same ideas. That's how you describe a brand, right? So looking at those from a friend to a brand, those are very kind of similar ways. And one of the easiest ways that I help to really define branding and what that means for for people. So yeah, I just found that such a cool clip, um, such an unusual sort of well, unusual in a way, but 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 then not unusual in another way, just in terms of defining, you know, the why, the purpose of the brand, and and you know, I thought it was quite funny when he said like, you know, if I came up to you and said, you know, why do you like me, and um, and so on, I thought that was awesome, but I would I won't ask you that, Jacob, because I know you don't like me. Yeah, I mean the beard, that's mainly it. That's probably you forgive me that. 
you know, but, but, you know, outside of that, probably not a lot. But, you know, that, 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 I thought that was really smart. You could tell Carl is a really smart kind of cookie, if you like, if I can call him that. Um, and, uh, and he went on in the episode, you know, we really dug deep into, okay, so how does he run these large teams? I think he's currently the, uh, the, the chief branding officer at, um, at uh, SodaStream in Canada. And um, so really interesting kind of thoughts. This is what he said around org design. The best kind of structures that I've, I've always looked at has been ones that look at strategy and execution right? And how they work together. Uh, I believe that as anyone who's looking to be great in brand and great in marketing needs to understand both sides of the coin, right? And if you, I usually, like, I usually like to start people in, in the execution side at first. You understand reality. You understand kind of what, what can happen and what doesn't, uh, and then move to strategy. And every, uh, every marketer I, I talk to, whether it's people who fresh out of university or people who are trying to shift into this, their answer is, I want, to, I want to do strategy for brand. But you don't necessarily know how that works yet. You don't know kind of the, the ins and outs. So having somebody understand speed on the street to then actually help to create that brand vision is, is super critical. So those are kind of the two, the two functions I always look at. Now, you can, you can divide that as much as you want. You can look at having a research team, an insights team, uh, another team that focuses just on PR. Like Whatever your type of brand is and how you find the best ways to connect there is no kind of one size fits all, but it is important to once again, look at here's the brand that we are creating here's, or the company, however you want to spin it. And then here are the best ways that we feel as a brand, we are going to communicate. And this is how we're going to do that. So it goes back to what are the needs that you need and then building a team around that. But I'm a strong believer in those kind of two, two functions of strategy and execution are, are, are critical to any successful brand. I think that was a super insight. There's just one other, I'm just gonna play and then let's chat. The, the biggest challenge I'd say within this space is uh, when you have too many people trying to input their own, their own views into something. Um, now it's great, I believe a good idea can come from anywhere, uh, but when you're having people from all different functions trying to weigh in on something uh, without a reason for why, that's where it kind of gets muddled, right? And that's why it's important to have that sort of that crisp alignment. Um, I think alignment's key. That's that's one of the, the biggest things. So, you know, I just found that episode so fascinating. He talks about alignment being the biggest challenge of running a big, uh, you know, a big company and looking at brand. But he also talked about how he looks at, uh, you know, in terms of, 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 of kind of building brands around that strategy the, the team that builds the strategy and, and keeps checking in on that. And then the team that does the execution and make sure that, that the brand lives. Really smart, really smart episode. Um, and of course, obviously he was focused on in-house brand building, which obviously would be useful to some of our listeners. But even if you're not interested in working in-house or running a, running a, a team, as it were, that, that, that does everything, I definitely think that there was some, some nuggets of gold there around around how Carl approaches things because even if you outsourced or, 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 or you know your strategy work or outsourced your execution work you still need to understand how it all fits together and and Carl had, a, had has had some great thoughts on that uh, what did you make of of that episode Jacob yeah I love that one and I loved his approach as well and especially that first clip when you're talking about brands and people I think it's a, a great analogy and I often use that as well because you know if you think about people's you know, heart, you know, can be the essence of the brand. And, you know, so many, when you're trying to talk about brand, you can talk about it as a person and there's many things you can talk about to actually communicate it. So uh, I think you did that much more um, <laughs> eloquently than myself, but he, <laughs> he uh, that's, that's probably the one that comment that I could best resonate with him and how you can create your brand like a person, right? What's the personality? What colors does it wear? Or what, uh, you know, what's, is it fun and loving or is it, you know, very bubbly or is it very, you know, low key? You know, what is the brand personality? So if you think about it like a person, you can start to put, put all the pieces together to craft that. So I think that's a great one. Um, the org structures, um, I thought was pretty fascinating how he uh, talked about that. It's something I haven't got personal, I haven't got personal experience in because I haven't ever worked at um, client side agency. So it's really fascinating to hear how he approaches it and manages a large teams as well. So yeah, definitely if, if you're curious about that, that this I think is the only one that we had on the show that was actually on the inside. So it's a really great uh, one to listen to if you're curious about that. 
Great. So, so you wanted to you wanted to jump into into in, uh, yes. into, into was it Julian's? Cut out that dead air. Um, yes, let's jump into Julian Cole now. So Julian, I've got a clip um, that he talks about strategy and dem demystifies strategy. So um, Julian comes from a agency background, so he does strategy for the, the big global brands. So he uh, was a, an amazing person to come on the show because he had, he really does come from. Um, you know, a unique strategy background. And he, what I found most interesting about Julian was that he, he didn't know who Marty Neumeyer was. So they, we're both Marty Neumeyer fans and anyone that's really come across strategy knows about Marty because he was like well, probably like the grandfather of, you know, brand strategy. However, Julian's come from a different realm. He's come from more of a um, marketing or comms kind of background. And he... Um, it, was a, it was a fascinating episode to listen to to see how he approached it. So in this clip, we talk about the strategy fundamentals he uses and the output or the deliverables that he provides to agencies and how he goes about it, which is a little bit different to how Matt and I go about brand building. So tune in um, to this. Strategy is such a mystery. You know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. No one really knows what's happening there. I like to talk about it in really easy outputs. Just think about clear outputs of what you actually have to deliver as an agency strategist. And to me, there's a couple of things. You're usually doing a research doc, which I use as the four C's, which is uh, company, culture, consumer, and category, where you're going off. And that I use it as my sketchbook of like finding all the research around those trends um, and putting that all together. And then getting to a creative brief, which is the output, second output which is um, usually a relationship that I'm having. Uh, I'll write usually three different creative briefs. I'll take that to the creative director, see which one he's resonating around, he thinks is good, get that kind of signed off and then brief in the rest of the teams. So that's my second output. The third output would be the strategy upfronts. So when we go back and present the creative, I'm doing the upfronts to really understand and sell the creative ideas if they're you know on brief. And then um, consolidating the creative feedback and then creating the comms framework, all those kind of documents that keep everything coherent, like coherent action, keep it all integrated. So a comms framework, which is messages and media together. And then I call it a blueprint, which is pretty much an ecosystem. Um, how everything's living together, how the different messages coming through different media. But then what I do is also put production dollars. Um, I carve the different production dollars out through those different pieces. So they're usually the key documents. And then afterwards is a measurement or wrap report. So working with whoever the provider is and probably the media agency as well to show and evaluate how the actual campaign did. So as you can hear, Julian is very well uh, versed in the agency side of strategy and he's kind of like bridging the gap between creatives and the clients. So it's kind of like a, you know, a managerial role there and putting all the pieces together including budgets and you know just making sure that the client's problem is actually being solved and being translated effectively to uh the creatives which is a crucial point that we often overlook it's like okay well how do we redefine the client's brief into a creative brief that actually creatives can follow and still solve the problem that the client had so um that's a really great episode and a very unique one and julian is amazing um, person you should go follow. He's also got a you know academy that teaches strategy for you know, agency side. So um, that's one to check out. So Chris, your thoughts, Matt? I loved uh, you know Julian's approach. I, as you say, it's a little bit different to how I'd attack things. Um, you know, but you know his depth of knowledge and his and and I think his his understanding of the execution of you know large scale brand activation campaigns. Um, was second to none, you know, and the fact that he's out there sharing his 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 in depth knowledge in that area, I just think super helpful. I, I I get his emails through all the time, and he's always doing really really interesting stuff. So definitely check him out. Sign up to his newsletter. Um, you know, one to watch for sure. Yeah, there's not many people out there um, on the agency side um, kind of doing what he does. So it's very uniquely uh, positioned. And um, yeah, as I said, go check him out. There's one last person. But not least, last but not least. We couldn't fit every single guest in. I think we had, you know, 20 odd guests. So otherwise this would have been very, very long. But we have one last person, that's Rob Levinson. And he, he speaks spoke about personal branding. 
And I think this is a great one to end on because we all have personal brands, whether we like it or not, we do. So how do we effectively you know, craft the right um, persona for our brand? He has some really great tips in this episode, but, but the clip I'm going to show is going to get to the point. The first thing that um, I recommend people do when they're creating their personal brand narrative is first of all, to do a self audit. And by that, I mean, you know, take a hard look in the mirror and make a list of what are you good at? I mean, I'm not talking necessarily about you as a person, but what are your skills? What are your qualities? What, what differentiates you? And be very, very, very honest with yourself. And then also in the next column say, well, here, here are areas of weakness. Here are things I have to work on. Here are things I have to market against. And once you have done a very uh, hard and serious assessment of yourself, I recommend doing a survey monkey with people in your world whose opinions you respect. And you make it anonymous and you ask them to answer questions about yourself. For example, here are the questions that I, I always recommend people use. So Matt, if it was you, um, the first question I would recommend you ask your constituents, when you think of Matt, what are the one or two word associations that come to mind? Um, Idiot, lemon. No, 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 no. <laughs> What do you what do you think Matt is best at? Um, Nothing at all. If they were to make a movie about Matt's life, who would play the lead character? Um, if right, Matt yeah. was an automobile, what make and model would he be, and why? If you could give Matt some anonymous advice, so ask all these this very personal questions, mm -hmm. and then a story emerges. So when I ask who would play you in your life story, it's not who do you look like, but who has your aura? Who has your essence? Who do, what, what box do people put you in? And then of course, you've asked, you've asked yourself these questions and you compare and contrast what you hear in the marketplace. And the, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. There you have it. So very to the point as well, uh, like many of our other guests, very qualified when it comes to brand. So, if you wanted to learn more about personal branding, go check out Rob Levinson's episode, as well as one from season one. I think it's Tom Ross and Mike Jan that we had on the show talking about personal branding. So let's that was that awesome. Into, yeah. So I've just realized what a jerk I am with some of our guests who are trying to make a really serious point. And, and they use the pick on me, isn't it? I just completely train wreck everything they're about to say. But thankfully, Rob, uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't too sidetracked by my idiocy and, uh, and, and was able to kind of land his point. But yeah, that was a, a super episode. I think Rob's focus on personal branding is really, really good. And I think even if you work, um, you know, for an agency or you work within a company, um, you know, as, as you said, Jacob, everybody has a personal brand that, that really they need to be conscious of and begin to manage. Um, and so having exercises and, and just doing some sort of personal reflection around that really, really it can be powerful, can leverage you in, in your career in, in a multitude of ways. So definitely check that episode out. Hey, have we come to the end, Jacob? have we have what and i know we've missed like loads of awesome ones out as well so we're going to get a load of hate mail coming through where's mine um but you know we, we we couldn't fit everybody in as you say um you know i think we should say a huge thank you to all our guests who came on the show a massive massive thank you to all our listeners and subscribers thank you so much for your support i honestly get uh, messages all the time from folks um, you know, thankfully not hate mail. Uh, maybe I'll get some of that after this episode. But, you know, um, genuinely positive community uh, spirit and, and thankfulness and gratitude uh, being shared with, with me. And, and I know you get it as well, Jacob. So we, we are thankful for you for listening in, for giving us suggestions. And, and again, I think that's probably worth iterating. We would love your suggestions. If there's people that you think we should have on the show, if there's themes, if there's ideas that you want to know more about, please jump on and let us know. We are planning season three as we speak. We've got some phenomenal guests lined up for you with some amazing content. Um, so keep checking us out. Keep hitting subscribe. Keep sharing us on social media. That, is, that really makes our day. We're pretty uh, egotistical at heart. Well, me probably. Um, so, you know, it makes my day when I see someone shared, uh, you know, one of our episodes. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. To, to you all. Jacob, any thoughts from you? I repeat that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, just one more thing. A review is the biggest way you can say thank you for us because it helps us reach more people. So 
if you've been enjoying our show the past few years, please give us a, a positive review, five stars, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to hear any other kind of reviews, you know, frankly. Less than five. <laughs> Just send that to us privately. We will listen to those two, um, you know, but yeah. They're awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great a great shout, you know, and, and that's the thing. We're trying to um, obviously increase our, our listenership. Um, this, this, this kind of helps us in a number of ways, so please do give us that review. Right. Well, that's the end of season two, folks. Um, Thank you so much. Um, That's it. Over and out from me and Jacob. Take care. Keep branding and, uh, and, and keep it real. Thank you.